Okay, lovely. So yeah, good morning um, and welcome to this webinar in partnership with Caxton Business. Um, our speaker today is Michael Brown. He's a senior market analyst. Um, he's been leading Caxton's analysis, forecasting and thought leadership um, within all areas of financial marketing. Um, Michael will present a review of the UK economy over the last six months since lockdown was imposed, as well present a look ahead of what the future may hold for the economy. Um, within the next six to 12 months. So, Michael, would you like to start your slides and welcome you? Thanks, Hannah. Yes, I will do. Let me just uh, share my screen so you can see. The, uh, hopefully you can all uh, see that. If I could just have a thumbs up to let me know I can. Perfect. Brilliant. In that case, we will get going. Good morning, everybody. As Hannah said, my name is Michael Brown. I'm the Senior Market Analyst with Caxton. And this morning, I wanted to spend some time Firstly, looking over what has happened over the last six months or so since lockdown was imposed uh, on the UK economy, what impact that has had uh, here in the UK. Then to look ahead to what is likely to happen over the next six months. Obviously, the outlook remains very, very uncertain indeed, but we'll uh, have a, a very good stab uh, at having a, a look at what's going to happen. And then also, finally, to have a look at how this will impact financial markets, primarily UK assets uh, and the pound, of course, which has been very, very volatile of late as well. So firstly, looking back at the last six months, things moved very, very quickly um, during the coronavirus crisis from this is a disease that is sort of isolated to China and not something that we need to concern ourselves about to less than two months after the first case was reported in the UK, the entire country going into lockdown uh, for a number of months. So the impact of of the, the measures that were put in place was obviously felt primarily from the sort of last week of March when lockdown was announced. But uncertainties were building uh, in advance of that and government and monetary support measures were being provided in advance of that as well. You can see uh, two or three weeks before we locked down, uh, the budget was presented, the Bank of England announced an emergency rate cuts um, and other fiscal support measures were, were put in place as well. So we moved very, very quickly into lockdown we then moved rather slowly coming out of lockdown. Um, obviously, locking an economy down is much, much easier than reopening um, the economy. So we had, uh, I think it was over two or three months that things gradually reopened, starting with shops, then moving into indoor businesses, and then finally moving into the hospitality sector, pubs, hotels, etc. Uh, as we moved into the start of July. But it's important to mention that obviously there are still some sectors of the economy that are shut down. There are some sectors of the economy, um, thinking things like nightclubs and things like that. We were talking about university a moment ago. Um, they are not COVID secure. They cannot reopen um, in the present environment. So although we have got back to sort of 85, 90% of, of normal uh, since lockdown was imposed, there are still various businesses that are shut and they will continue to cause a drag on economic activity um, as we go through the remainder of the year. In terms of the economic impact itself, I would say it almost looks a little bit worse than it is. So that chart on the left there gives a very, very stark representation indeed of what happens when you shut an economy down. It is no surprise to see that GDP fell off a cliff um, in Q2 of 2019. It's almost as if the, someone had turned out a light switch on the economy, turned it off overnight. Of course, GDP is going to fall um, to its lowest levels in, in a number of years. And it makes the financial crisis, which is circled there, look very, very minor indeed compared to what we've had with the shock of the coronavirus. Now, you will have seen the chart on the right, and this is where I'm talking about it looks worse than it is. You'll have seen the chart on the right, I'm sure, in many papers and in many publications showing how the UK has had one of the, the steepest falls in GDP uh, across the world. Now, there are two things that we need to bear in mind when we're looking at this chart. Yes, it is true. The UK did have the biggest fall in GDP. But firstly, you need to think about when countries lock down. Italy, France and Spain, for example, all locked down at the beginning of March. So when economic activity bottomed there, it was actually in Q1 rather than in Q2. So the impact of lockdown in the second quarter was somewhat less significant than it was here in the UK, where the vast majority, all but about a week of our lockdown, came in the second quarter. The other thing that it's important to remember 
is that the UK has very much a services driven and a consumer driven economy. So when you shut non-essential businesses, when you pretty much halt all consumer spending, that is going to have much more of a significant impact on the UK economy than on other economies which have more of a dependence on manufacturing, for example, such as Germany and, and parts of the Eurozone. So yes, the UK has had the biggest uh, impact in terms of, of the coronavirus lockdowns when you measure it by GDP and gross domestic product, but that also means because a lot of it is consumer driven, the UK will have likely have a much quicker economic rebound, at least in the initial phases as we come out of the coronavirus pandemic. Now, this consumer-driven economy that I mentioned, this chart from the Bank of England shows this quite well, how consumer spending is broken down. And this should give you a bit of an idea uh, on why we had such a significant impact. Essentially, consumer spending was reduced to about 50% of where it normally is because all social spending was cut out as a result of, of lockdown. And, and all work-related spending was cut out due to people working from home and still working from home. And then this delayable spending, that was also, well, either delayed or perhaps cancelled as a result of non-essential businesses being closed and as a result of job losses uh, caused by the coronavirus pandemic people tightening their belts, people having less disposable income, uh, and that caused that spending to, to be delayed. So essentially, from March until the beginning of July, the UK economy was running at roughly 50% of, of normal when it comes to consumer spending. And that is one of the primary reasons why the UK has had such a significant, or a, a more of a significant impact when it comes uh, to, to, the, to the impact of lockdown on the economy. Now, I mentioned job losses and uh, disposable income. Of course, the labour market has been propped up by the furlough scheme, by the coronavirus job retention scheme, where the government have been paying, well, it was 80% of, of wages. I think it's now 60 as we move into October and the scheme begins to wind down. Um, the unemployment numbers in the UK are not telling the full story of what's going on. Unemployment in three months to July was at 4.1%, according to the ONS. But when you take into account the number of people who were on furlough in, during July, unemployment should be somewhere near a 9 or perhaps even 10%. So the, the labour market has been significantly distorted by what's happened with the furlough scheme. At one point, we had almost a third of the entire UK labour force um, being paid by the government under the coronavirus job retention scheme. It's going to come at a cost of well over £50 billion. And only time will tell whether the furlough scheme has sufficiently worked in terms of keeping people in employment or whether it has merely been a rather expensive way of prolonging the inevitable wave of mass redundancies that we are going to see when the scheme concludes. Now, the, the scheme is obviously rolling down as we speak and, and only time will tell on that front. But there were some promising numbers from the ONS this morning saying that there are now only 10% uh, of the people who were originally on furlough still on the scheme. Now, whether that is because they have lost their jobs or whether that is because they have gone back to employment remains to be seen, but the labour market has been propped up and in some ways distorted by what's happened with the uh, job retention scheme, which was obviously uh, a completely new invention by the Treasury back in March, something of the kind that, that we've never had before in the UK. I mentioned the, the Treasury moved quickly to come up with a furlough scheme. In fact, the Treasury and the Bank of England moved very, very quickly indeed to come up with all of their support measures at the height of the coronavirus crisis. So I remember many uh, days where you'd have monetary policy decisions, emergency policy decisions at sort of seven o'clock in the morning, and that would set the tone for the remainder of the day. So the Bank of England enacted a total of 65 basis points worth of uh, interest rate cuts, taking the bank rate from three quarters of 1% to a tenth of 1% where it stands at the moment. We've also had £310 billion worth of additional bond purchases from the Bank of England, again, trying to, to lower market interest rates. We've had various ways of uh, ensuring that the interest rate cuts are transmitted to the end user. So we had the introduction of something called the term funding scheme, which is a way of providing incentives to, to UK banks to lend to small businesses to help them in the crisis. We also had the corporate credit financing facility, 
which is a, a very fancy way of saying the Bank of England were buying companies' bonds, buying companies' debt uh, in order to, to try and seed them through and, and solve the liquidity issues that, that people were having in March. And then we've also had a huge response from the fiscal side, a humongous amount of government spending. This has taken the debt to GDP ratio above 100% for the first time in a number of years, although that is a very, very uncertain ratio given we're not entirely sure where GDP is at the moment. But we've had schemes that were firstly focused on relief, on putting a floor under the economy, on ensuring that things don't get any worse than they had to during lockdown, things like the furlough scheme, things like uh, loan guarantees from the government and things like deferral of business rates. And now we've seen a gentle and a gradual shift towards providing stimulus. So we've had the eat out to help out scheme to try and boost the restaurant sector. We've had a cut in stamp duty to try and boost the housing market. I think uh, that is unnecessary, but, but that's a conversation for another day. Um, we've also got the new kickstart scheme to try and get younger people back into employment. So we had a very, very quick, swift, comprehensive policy response at the start of the pandemic, which was focused on putting a floor under the economy. And we're now seeing fiscal authorities move to providing stimulus now that the initial phase of the crisis is over, now that lockdown is behind us, providing stimulus to try and support the economy and to try and cement the economic recovery that we are now seeing. Now, I know this uh, presentation this morning is largely focused on the UK, but I do just want to mention that the Bank of England and the Treasury have provided uh, a very, very valuable and a very, very important lesson to other countries in how monetary and fiscal policy should coordinate during a crisis. If you look at the US at the moment, talks over another stim uh, fiscal stimulus package are deadlocked. They have been deadlocked for two or three months now in Congress. Um, and that just shows how uh, the, the impact that will have, sorry, on the US recovery will be quite significant. It puts more pressure on the Federal Reserve to do more. And it, it's really, given the monetary policy arsenals around the world have been significantly depleted since the financial crisis in 2008, um, I think more nations should look at what the UK did during the crisis uh, and take those lessons and put them into their playbook for the inevitable next recession whenever it comes. Speaking of the future, it's worth looking at what the rest of 2020 might have in store. Now, uh, the word of the year has obviously been unprecedented. No one could have predicted exactly what's happened this year. And I think even if I had a crystal ball in front of me, uh, I wouldn't be able to tell you everything that is going to happen during the remainder of 2020. But we will give it a stab nonetheless. I think what's important to recognise, first of all, though, is no matter what we say uh, about the economy, no matter what we think is going to happen with the economic recovery as we go through into Q3 and, and into Q4, is that fundamentally the path of the economy will depend on the path of the coronavirus, on the path that the pandemic takes and how any flare-ups in virus cases are controlled. Now, there seems very, very little uh, desire to go back to full-scale nationwide lockdowns, as we had back in March and in April. And in fact, I think whether there's the desire or not to do it, they would be completely unaffordable anyway. Um, but that said, if we do see a flare-up in cases, further measures are likely to be brought in, further restrictions are likely to be imposed, and that will significantly hit both consumer and business confidence and cause a drag on the economy. So it's important to bear in mind that no matter what I or any other economist says, the path of the economy will be led by the path that the pandemic itself takes. Now, in terms of activity, in terms of what's going on in the UK economy, traditional economic indicators, uh, GDP, retail sales, uh, factory orders, things like that, have become a little bit useless during the coronavirus, to be honest. They are um, they're very, very reliable in, in uh, data points, but they are lagging. They are out of date. And when we're trying to work out what's happening in the economy now, in such a fast-moving situation as, as we are currently in, looking at data for two months ago really doesn't tell us a lot. So what economists have had to do is pivot away from traditional hard economic data releases towards newer uh, live economic indicators. So I've got two here. The first is, is mobility data. Uh, both Apple and Google are putting together very, very useful data sets uh, on these. And what this shows is two things. Firstly, it shows that economic activity bottomed out in early April. 
So a few weeks, probably three weeks after lockdown was imposed on the 23rd of March, the UK economy bottomed out. Businesses began to reopen, serving takeaways, etc., and people began to venture out of their houses again, slowly but surely re-engaging with the economy. We can now see, and, and this chart goes up until the end of August, so it is a, a slightly out of date. I haven't updated it recently, but the, the trend, I'm sure, has continued. We can now see that both driving and walking uh, activity is pretty much where it was before lockdown. Now, obviously, these lines fluctuate because of weekends. You have more people driving on a Saturday than on a Sunday, obviously. But the, the trend is upwards, and clearly both driving and walking is back where it was before the pandemic began. The crucial one, though, to look at, and, and this primarily affects our cities, is transit. Public transit usage, public transport usage, is really struggling to get back to where it was before uh, lockdown. It, it is moving in the right direction, but it's moving very, very slowly in the right direction. And obviously, the majority of public transport networks are in our cities. And I can vouch anecdotally, sad in the city at the moment, that although things are getting busier, they're nowhere near where they were beforehand. So I think that's important to recognize that the economic recovery is very, very different depending on where you look in the UK. Uh, restaurants, for example, in the West End will not be performing as well as restaurants in towns in, in Surrey, Sussex, and Speaking of restaurants, obviously lockdown uh, had a, a very, very severe, disastrous impact on the restaurant sector with business shut for four months uh, during the, the height of the pandemic. You can see, though, that bookings on a year-on-year -year basis, and this data is from OpenTable, the, the reservations provider, have begun to increase. They are now on a nice-looking upward trend, obviously distorted slightly by the Eat Out to Help Out scheme, which is highlighted in, in green on those bars there. But nonetheless, restaurants are getting busier, and that is important, one, because our hospitality industry is a large part of the UK economy. Two, because consumer spending is so much of the UK economy, so more people spending in restaurants implies more spending in, in other businesses as well, and live credit card data backs that up. And thirdly, it shows that people now have more confidence to go and eat out, and that implies they've got more confidence to go and re-engage with other parts of the economy. So these live indicators are very, very useful, one, for telling us what's going on in specific sectors, but two, for telling us also what's going on more broadly in the economy in terms of consumer confidence. I know the government, and I agree with this, believe that consumer confidence is going to be absolutely key in terms of the economic recovery. Now, speaking of the recovery, um, typically economists like to assign letters to the economy, to assign letters to recessions to try and make them simple for, for the layman to understand. We usually deal in terms of a V, which is a very quick rebound in activity, a U, which is a slightly slower grind back to, to, to where we were before a recession hit, and an L, where the economy contracts very, very quickly and then stagnates. Now, this is all well and good, but of course, uh, the coronavirus uh, has really thrown all this up in the air, and, and unfortunately, using letters now. Uh, isn't actually the easiest way of, of describing what we're likely to see. Instead, consensus, and, and I'm with the consensus here, has sort of formed around what I've ringed in yellow there, um, either a tick-shaped or a swoosh-shaped, or I've even heard some people call it a square root sign flipped on its head shape, uh, economic recovery, where what you will see is a very sharp fall in economic output, as we saw in Q2 on those charts I showed you earlier as a result of lockdown, followed by a very sharp rebound, partially rebounding to where we were before the lockdown uh, was imposed as businesses reopen and as businesses are, uh, are allowed to, to resume uh, operations. That will be what I would like to term expansion in the economy by default. You put, shut things down, you turn them back on again. If someone sells zero widgets in June and sells one widget in July, then obviously that is going to result in, in economic growth. But then as the impacts of the, uh, the pandemic become clearer, as the longer term scarring from the pandemic becomes clearer, you see a more gradual rebound to somewhere near trend growth levels. So I think what we're going to see is the economy not get back to where we were in Q4 2019 until 2022 at the very, very earliest. 
Now, the other important thing to note about the recovery and about coronavirus and how this crisis is very, very different to what we've seen in the past is that normally when you have a recession, it is firstly caused by something inside the financial system, which wasn't. But secondly, normally an economic slowdown is accompanied by economic pain. You would usually see when GDP falls, you would usually see inflation fall, you would usually see unemployment rise, and you would see wages fall as well. That's not been the case with the coronavirus because the government support measures that have been put in place have split the economic recession from the economic pain. So what we are actually likely to see is the recession in Q1 and in Q2, where the economy uh, contracted. In Q3, a bounce, that expansion by default that I mentioned. But then in Q4 is really crunch time, October, November, December. When government support measures expire, that is when people will start to feel the pain that is usually associated with a recession. So you've almost had the two split out from each other. And it will be very, very interesting to see how governments manage that and whether the additional stimulus that is likely to come in the remainder of the year uh, can help to, to make that pain a little bit easier to deal with. Now, it's important to note, though, that with the economic recovery, how you feel the recovery, how you see the economy developing, will very much depend on where you are in the economy. Now, this has been termed a K-shaped recovery, where some businesses will absolutely thrive as a result of what's happened. Think about the tech sector, for example. Think about Zoom. I don't think I'd ever logged into Zoom before March. Now I'm logged in at least twice a day doing presentations and meetings. Uh, pharmaceuticals, for example, the hunt for vaccines and therapeutics for COVID, that is obviously going to be a bit of a boon for the pharmaceutical sector. But then you have other businesses who will be on the bottom leg of that K. You have the travel sector, you have bricks and mortar retail, you have commercial real estate, for example, who are going to experience, quite frankly, depression-like conditions uh, for a number of years. So while the broader economy will probably get back to where we were last year by 2022, as I said, some businesses are already performing better than they were last year, and other businesses Will take much much longer to get there for example the travel sector we don't think um the demand for, for air travel will return to its 2019 levels until late 2024 uh, and then things like bricks and mortar retail well they could be dead forever um if people have shift online shifted online to amazon and etc that really could be the sort of final nail in the coffin for the high street so while you will see the economy recover and get back to where we were in 2019, probably be a bit bumpy uh, as the coronavirus makes various flare ups until we have a vaccine available. Um, how you feel that economic recovery really will depend on where you sit in the economy, which sector you operate in, that will really be the, the primary determinant uh, of how you feel the new normal, in uh, both your personal and your, your business finances. Now, I mentioned the recovery is likely to be bumpy and the risks to the economic recovery are firmly tilted and skewed to the downside. Now, there are a number of risks, but I've mentioned three uh, here and I will mention another one on the next slide. Obviously, the first is a second wave of coronavirus infections or a resurgence in coronavirus cases, whatever semantics you want to use. Uh, to describe that. We're already seeing signs that this is happening probably earlier uh, than we had thought. Most expected uh, a second wave, if it were to occur, to come in kind of October, November. It already seems to be here, at least that's what the signs across Europe and, and now in the UK are telling us based on the rising number of cases. Now, of course, coronavirus coming back could be combined with a severe flu outbreak. You could have health services being overwhelmed. But I think, as I mentioned earlier, there is very, very little appetite for a return to, to nationwide lockdowns of the kind that we saw um, all the way back in, in March and April. I think what you will see instead is localized measures to try and control hotspots, if at all possible. But of course, the media uh, splashing on headlines of rising numbers of cases, consumers will see that, become more worried, become more reluctant, and perhaps fail to, to reinvent further with the economy. So that is, of course, the primary risk. And as I said, the path of the economy will depend on the path of the pandemic. 
Secondly, you have the expiration of the furlough scheme, the coronavirus job retention scheme. Now, this will cause a rise in unemployment. Sadly, unemployment is going to be somewhere between three and four million by year end. I think I've said for a while that the Treasury and the government keeping unemployment below four million by year end would be a good result. Um, I don't like using the word good there because it would still mean an unemployment rate of around 10% and unemployment of the like we haven't seen since the 70s and 80s. But given the situation we are in, it would be better than, than expected. The focus, though, importantly, has shifted from job retention to job creation. So certain jobs, unfortunately, are not going to exist in the economy, and the government have realised that and are now shifting towards creating new employment for people. I think the important thing to, to recognise, and this is something that, that I believe should come into place, is a targeted scheme. So where government measures mean that certain businesses either cannot operate at all or cannot operate at full capacity, I think it's very important that the government introduce some sort of targeted job retention scheme for those sectors, because otherwise we risk adjusting our labour market and resetting our labour market to an, uh, to an economy mid-pandemic rather than a post-pandemic. So I do think a short, targeted extension of the scheme for specific sectors is something that is worth considering. I think it is something that we are probably likely to see come into place um, before the end of October when the current scheme winds down. The other thing for the Treasury to, to think about is balancing the books. Now, obviously, at the moment, you have very, very low interest rates. So uh, borrowing is, is very, very cheap indeed. And servicing our debt is very, very easy as well. But unfortunately, interest rates will rise at some point. It's going to be a long time in the future, but interest rates will not stay at this level forever. And as a result, our present borrowing levels cannot continue indefinitely. So at some point, the books will have to be balanced. There seems to be absolutely no appetite for a return to the austerity that we saw after the 2008-09 financial crisis. So it is likely to come in the form of tax rises. That said, I think tax rises as soon as the November budget actually run the risk of slamming the brakes on the economic recovery entirely because a tightening of fiscal policy when you're just coming out of a recession is a surefire way of tipping your economy back into a recession. So I think the question of balancing the books will wait for about 18 months or so. Maybe this time next year, late 2021, we'll be having the conversation about how do we get our public finances back on an even keel. But for now, the government focuses firmly on stimulus rather than on balancing the books, and rightly so. The other risk that obviously needs to be considered and had been out of the news for most of the year, but is now most certainly back with a vengeance, is Brexit. The post-Brexit transition period will end. It will end on the 31st of December. We know there is no desire to extend that from either the government or the EU, and talks over a free trade agreement are pretty much deadlocked at the moment. I think uh, some kind of political event intervention is going to happen. It is needed to kickstart the negotiations, because if you look at the mandates, and unfortunately part of my job is reading the negotiating mandates, which aren't the most thrilling things in the world, as I'm sure you can imagine, they are completely incompatible with each other. And no matter what the negotiators do, they have to negotiate to the mandates that they were given by the politicians. The politicians are the only ones who can change those mandates. So I think what we will see is some political intervention, a change in those mandates, and a skinny free trade agreement agreed early in Q4, potentially around the timing of the next EU summit, which is on the 15th of October. I think that's the important date for the diary. In terms of probabilities, which are always hard to assign uh, to the political landscape. I think uh, the chances of a deal are at around 60%, and I think the chances of a WTO exit are around 40% at the moment. But of course, businesses should be preparing for either outcome, because even with a free trade agreement, and the exact terms of access will obviously depend on what agreement is struck, but even with a free trade agreement, things will be different in January 2021 to how they are now. Now, we mentioned uh, policy a, a moment ago. Uh, it's important to look at how the UK can cement our economic recovery. Now, on the fiscal side, we've, we've spoken about that at, at some length and how we've moved from relief and putting a floor under the economy to stimulus and trying to cement recovery. But the monetary side is a little bit more interesting 
because I think the Bank of England have, and rightly, because there isn't much more they can do, handed the baton over to the Treasury and gone, you need to cement this recovery. Because there are really only three levers, three policy levers that the Bank of England can pull, and all of them are of, of questionable efficacy. So firstly, the Bank of England could do more quantitative easing. We have a BOE meeting today. They're not going to do any more QE today, but they will probably boost the program by 100 billion pounds in November. But whether that will actually do anything, given that yields are, are so low already, is questionable. They could also tweak the term funding scheme and provide an easier credit to, to banks to flow through into the real economy. But again, taking the, the rate on that from a tenth of 1% to zero is probably not going to make much difference to the banking sector. The third option, which is something of a nuclear button, uh, if you like, for the BOE, is to take bank rate negative, to charge a, a interest on deposits at the Bank of England. Now, we've seen the ECB do this in Europe, we've seen the BOJ do this in Japan and a handful of other central banks, uh, and quite frankly, negative interest rates do not work. The Federal Reserve in the US have, have basically come out and said this and decided that it is not an appropriate policy for the US economy, while I would hope the BOE would do the same thing for the UK, they haven't yet. They're saying it's still under active review and that negative rates are in their toolbox. That said, I think looking at the tone from policymakers of late, it is clear that negative rates would be an absolute last resort option that they would only go to if, if all else had failed. But it is, of course, a risk that we need to be aware of. But I think negative interest rates could actually have the opposite effect to, to how it is intended if they were to come into place. So I bet it's definitely not my base case, but if we were to have a, a severe second wave, if we were to have a WTO Brexit and the economy was ahead very, very far south once more, then you could see the BOE delving further into their toolbox and, and looking to take rates below zero. So finally, I just want to look very quickly at how this will all affect financial markets. Now, firstly, foreign exchange, which is sort of my bag, if you like, um, the consensus for sterling is for a gentle appreciation in the value of the pound over the next uh, 12 months or so. So cable, which is sterling against the dollar, trades at roughly 129 at the time of, of presenting this. Uh, the median forecast uh, for about a year's time is, is around 131. So a very, very slight appreciation. Those forecasts, though, are all conditioned on the assumption that there will be some kind of a Brexit deal. If we don't have a Brexit deal, then you will see not necessarily a similar reaction to what we saw after the referendum, where Sterling got tonight, but you will see significant downside in the pound, I would say in the region of around 125 by year end, if we did have a WTO Brexit. But it's important to note that even if we did, I think it'd be very, very quick, uh, very, very short order, sorry, before the negotiators get back around that table and get a deal done. So I think sterling remains a pretty good buy on dips for now. As for the UK equity market, the FTSE 100, which is the, the benchmark index here in the UK, you can see on the right there that the FTSE followed a path very similar to other global equity markets up until the end of March. Uh, bumbling along throughout most of January, the coronavirus becomes a concern uh, mid-February and the market really does fall out of bed, down 30, 40 percent uh, from mid-February to to. to March, including, I think, notching its, its biggest one-day fall on record a, a number of times during that decline. What's happened since March is interesting, though, and this comes back to the K-shaped recovery that I outlined earlier on. If you look on the left and how the sectors of the FTSE are weighted, you can see there is a lot of consumer staples, of bricks and mortar, uh, retail. There is a lot of energy uh, who are, are going to be very hard hit indeed, given government's desire to build back greener as a result of the pandemic. There are a lot of financials in the index that are obviously being harmed by what's going on with, with interest rates and how interest rates are, are so low. But the real important thing to, to focus on, this brown coloured segment of the pie chart here labelled information technology. Tech is going to be the biggest sector powering the economic recovery and powering global equity markets higher as we move into the next 12, 18 months. And the weighting of, of tech in the FTSE 100 is quite frankly tiny. It is the second smallest sector in the index in, in many ways, and I've stolen this just to just 
FTSE, the FTSE is a 20th century index in a 21st century world. So unfortunately for UK investors, and particularly um, UK pension funds who are heavily invested in the FTSE, the, the index is going to face very, very stiff structural headwinds over the coming years, I would say, given this sector breakdown. Uh, and I think the FTSE is going to significantly lag global peers. The FTSE is, is about 20% down year to date still at the moment. The benchmark US in the index, the S&P 500, is about 5% to the good on a year to date basis. Just gives you an idea of how significantly the FTSE is likely to lag behind peers for the foreseeable future, given that, that puny weighting towards the technology sector. And then finally, looking at the fixed income market, the government bond space, this is uh, the gilt curve. So this is uh, UK government debt plotted from one month maturity all the way out to, to 50 years in the future. And you can see that the curve has become, uh, well, firstly, much higher, but also much steeper than we saw uh, in July and, and also uh, compared to what we saw back in March. But, but that isn't on the chart here. Um, this curve steepness is likely to continue if the, the market maintains a relatively high degree of faith in the UK recovery and in reflation here in the UK, inflation heading higher, growth heading higher. Um, although it is important to note that if the curve gets too steep, you may see the Bank of England come in uh, and try and push yields a little bit lower by more quantitative easing. But the most important takeaway from this chart is, I would say, uh, looking at the yields themselves. The UK government can borrow 50-year debt at 75 basis points, which is absolutely dirt cheap, close to record lows. Uh, and that is one of the primary reasons why we don't need to worry about balancing the books just yet. Now, I do have, well, we do have a bit of time for, for a question and answer session. I think the best way uh, of doing this is probably to um, put the questions in the, the little chat box, and then we can, uh, I, I can go through, I'll read the questions out and, and also try my best to answer them. I've got a, a couple here already. Firstly, one about the US election. I know this is obviously um, focused primarily on, on the UK this morning's uh, presentation, but on the US election, how will that affect the pound and how will that affect the economy? Um, I think it's, it's obviously going to affect the dollar more than it's going to affect sterling, but um, US elections are always difficult to call. Uh, in terms of their market impact, even more so this year, given um, that we don't really know a lot about either of the two candidates' plans or strategy for the next four years. Um, I think what I would say, though, is the biggest risk when it comes to the election is what we can call where neither candidate accepts the, the result of the plebiscite, and that will likely result in safe haven money going into the dollar, going into the bond market, and coming out of the economy. Uh, I've got another one here. Could there be a situation where the economy recovers quicker than expected, and what would that look like? Uh, there most definitely could be. The primary reason why that would happen would obviously be a virus, uh, not a virus, a vaccine for the virus. Um, now, the, there are a number of vaccines in development. Phase three trials of the Oxford vaccine, which is promising regime recently. And I think a, max, uh, a mass vaccination program would be the main reason for the economy to recover sooner than we think uh, to, to, to the end of 2023. Um, what it would look like is pretty much the opposite of that K-shaped recovery that I outlined. So those sectors that we think are going to outperform while social distancing measures remain in place, technology, pharmaceuticals, et cetera, um, if there was a broader economic recovery, you would see those slightly underperform and you would see traditional businesses, bricks and mortar businesses, the travel sector, et cetera, uh, recover much quicker. I think the other thing to bear in mind, and this is more of a tail risk to the equity market, is if we do see a quicker economic recovery, that means a quicker withdrawal of monetary and of fiscal stimulus. That is likely to pose a rather significant headwind um, to global equities if it were to occur, because one of the primary reasons they push higher is not necessarily expectations of a broad economic recovery, but is expectations that we will see uh, more and more stimulus pumped into the market. So I think a vaccine or a comprehensive cure for COVID is the primary reason why we would see a, a faster than expected recovery. 
Um, I have another one here uh, on the hospitality sector. So the rule of six, the end of the eat out to help out scheme and curfews, how will that affect the industry going forward? Um, well, I think the, uh, the, the rule of six is, is a very interesting one. Um, I don't have any expertise in, in the hospitality sector, but obviously uh, it, it will. I think the impact of it will come more from the hit to confidence rather than necessarily what it does um, to restaurants. Now, obviously, if people want to be creative and have a party of eight, they could do it for two days or four and, and get around the rule of six that way. But I think the imposition of the rule um, marks a bit of a shift from government from a summer of relaxing measures towards an autumn and a winter of perhaps tightening things more. And I think that is likely to hit consumer confidence and that may mean people are, are less likely to, to go and eat out and, and, and the hospitality sector. In terms of the eat out to help out scheme, um, the impact of it is something that I am somewhat dubious about, to be honest. Um, I, I obviously, as, as that chart I showed earlier um, showed, let me just bring that back up. Um, the Eat Out to Help Out scheme, uh, if I can find it here, where's it gone? Uh, did have a, a, provide a significant boost, here it is on the right there, um, to restaurant bookings on a Monday and a Tuesday and a Wednesday um, throughout the, the course of, of the voucher scheme. The problem, though, is if you look at um, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, when diner numbers were still down year on year. So I just wonder whether demand was shifted from the weekend to earlier in the week as a result of, of the scheme. Um, the end of it, I think, will obviously see reservations come lower because people won't no longer have, have the opportunity to get food, quite frankly. Um, I think whether um, it has a, a noticeable impact remains to be seen um, because of the fact that I think a lot of it was just shifting demand rather than necessarily actually stimulating. So I'm, I'm not convinced that the rule of six will have a, a, a significant impact, uh, the, the voucher scheme, sorry, will have a significant impact. And, and the curfew, obviously, this is something that at the moment seems somewhat limited to, to local hotspots. But again, I think that's more of a confidence factor um, rather than, than anything else. Another question here, uh, excuse me, on the retail sector uh, and about the high street and how, uh, I'll read the question now, retail stores were already at risk due to the rise of online shopping before the pandemic. This has only become more prominent throughout lockdown. Do you think our house, high streets can now compete? Um, quite frankly, I think the answer to that would, would be no. Um, because of this shift to, to online shopping, we've had such a, a significant move to, to doing everything online. I, I don't think the high street will recover to how it was before. Um, I think it's going to be very, very difficult to encourage people to go back and shop uh, in physical stores, having spent six months shopping online. Um, and I think actually the, the high street is going to be um, an industry that already was and sadly now will be in an accelerated version of a, a structural decline. Uh, another one here on Brexit, how will, uh, as will be a third country from January of 2021, how will the requirement for import and export declarations, regardless of a free trade agreement, affect the um, This is, I don't want to dodge the question, um, this is a difficult one because it will depend almost entirely on um, what the free trade agreement looks like, what the level of access with the, with the EU is compared to how it is now. Um, so there will be roadblocks there compared to, to how we have access to the single market now. That is a definite. Um, as for the exact specifics of it, um, that will really depend on, on the kind of deal that is agreed. But obviously, uh, any free trade agreement, we will have uh, more restrictive access to the EU market than we do now. And that will be a headwind for the economy. Uh, another question here uh, about the new normal. So uh, with a successful vaccine in place, what is your view on things going back to how it was pre-lockdown? Um, actually, this is an interesting analogy. Thinking back to 9-11 and how the forecast of reduction in rentals of tall buildings that were predicted to last very long. Um, this is, is interesting. Um, we were talking before you all joined the call about working from home uh, and how people have, have shifted to, to working remotely as a result of the pandemic. Um, I don't think personally that the new normal is going to be very different from the old normal. We've already seen people going back to their offices. We've already seen people going back to, to restaurants and to bars, et cetera. Um, obviously, travel is, is hit 
as a result of, of restrictions still. But I think the new normal is going to be quite similar to the old normal with some subtle changes. So I think people will spend less time in office. They may do four days a week rather than five in the office. Um, but the office is, is most certainly not dead in my mind. I think people will travel once again. I think there will be less business travel, but there will still be leisure travel, particularly as, as there's going to be a hell of a lot of pent up demand when travel restrictions do finally lift. So I think all of the talk in March and in April of this sort of utopic new normal that we're going to see um, was premature. And we've already seen things going back to how they were as restrictions have been lifted. So I think that analogy with 9-11 is, is a good one. And I think um, expectations that we could be living in a completely different world come uh, you know, the end of, of the coronavirus pandemic are, uh, are wrong. Uh, I did have another question here, but I've scrolled past it. Um, what three things should businesses consider? This is probably a good one to, to end the Q&A with, actually. Uh, what three things should businesses consider for the rest of 2020 for their forecasting and their business decisions? Um, well, I think the, the first thing is to expect the unexpected. If 2020 has taught us anything, it's that forecasts, economic forecasts, business forecasts, whatever they may be, can go out the window and be proved wrong very, very quickly. So expect the unexpected and plan for a number of different scenarios would, would be um, the first thing. I mean, when we're looking at the economy, we're thinking of a scenario where a vaccine comes quickly, a scenario where a vaccine comes sort of mid-21, and perhaps a scenario when the vaccine doesn't come at all. So that's how we kind of think about things when we talk about the economy. It's probably worth doing the same thing for your business. The other things to obviously consider is what impact would further restrictions have. We mentioned the rule of six. If there are further restrictions, how would they impact your business? Um, and also the third thing is to uh, think about and stay on top of, and, and we can obviously help with this, what additional support may be provided by the government. We mentioned that shift from relief to stimulus. Um, as more stimulus measures come in, it's important to stay on top of that uh, and avail yourself of, of all the available measures um, that are out there to try and, and get your business through um, what we're seeing. So really, it is just awareness of, of absolutely everything that, that is going on, planning for a range of scenarios and taking advantage of all the support. So I hope that um, presentation this morning has been useful. Um, if you would like to find out any more or, or have a chat about anything in, in more detail, then please feel free to, to get in touch. My details uh, are on the screen there. And, and as we said, I think it's um, recorded as well, so, so we can send that out to you. And do feel free uh, to share that if, if you think any of, of your colleagues or, or friends may be interested Recording. But uh, I hope that's been useful and, and you've uh, taken something uh, insightful away from, from this morning's presentation. It's certainly been uh, good to present to you, albeit through a, a camera rather than in person. Um, so thank you very much for, for watching. Uh,